welcome to this first webinar in a series of four webinars about how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. Uh, and this series is hosted by SAMRI, the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute in Adelaide, and the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research, which is being built even as we speak in Adelaide. Uh, my name's Julie McCrossan and I was treated eight years ago for stage four oropharyngeal cancer in my tonsils, tongue and throat uh, with radiation and chemo. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're broadcasting to you tonight on Aboriginal land. Uh, I'm in Sydney, the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to welcome Shona Edwards. Welcome to you, Shona. Shona was treated, hello. Shona was treated with proton therapy, which we'll be talking about shortly in Prague in 2018. And Shona is involved with a youth advisory group to the South Australian Youth Cancer Service with canteen leadership. I know you've spoken at a, 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 a COSA conference. It's all about survival from cancer. But just before we begin, Shona, we'll hear from you um, uh, at more length later, but what are you hoping to achieve by sharing your cancer experience, your cancer story? I'm driven by a need to make the struggle I've been through worth it, in a sense, by um, trying to improve um, the things just a little bit so that other patients can maybe avoid the things I found difficult. There's no point um, reinventing the wheel here. We're all going to have a unique experience. And you pick up tricks and um, tips along the way. So I think it's best if we share those things just to make things a little bit better in each different sphere. Well, look, thanks heaps for being part of this series right at the beginning and we'll uh, have an in-depth uh, uh, discussion with Shona Edwards a little bit later. I'll just quickly tell you there are four episodes, as I said, to this series. The first two are going to focus on proton therapy, a new kind of radiation therapy coming shortly to Australia. And we'll be hearing uh, from patients, from family members and from multidisciplinary members of clinical teams. And then the third and the fourth webinar in this series uh, will look at conventional radiation therapy in its many forms. Uh, episode three will focus on children, adolescents and young people. And uh, the final episode will look at closing the gap when it comes to cancer survival and rehabilitation for First Nations people. And we're travelling all over the world and all over Australia. So let's begin. First of all, tonight, we're going to travel to the United Kingdom, to London, and we're going to meet a team of people opening a new proton therapy service later this year. Welcome to this Australian conversation. Can you introduce yourself uh, to the patients and family and cancer teams watching and tell us your role for the new proton service? So my name is Yen Chang. I am a consultant clinical oncologist, which is a type of doctor who gives radiation therapy, which I believe in Australia may be called a radiation oncologist. And I am the clinical lead of this project, which means that I have overseen the project from its inception when it was just sort of plans on a piece of paper to the to the ramping up of all the services required to deliver a successful proton beam um, service. And we're going to uh, be meeting members of your team as part of this conversation and you're coming to us from different locations because we're recording this in the midst of uh, the COVID pandemic and thank you for joining us at this time. For people who just don't know about proton therapy, what is it and what are the special characteristics when compared to conventional radiation therapy that we're more familiar with? So I think the first thing to say is proton therapy is just a form of radiation therapy. The main difference is that rather than using x-rays, which is what we use in conventional therapy, we use particles, protons. And the reason for that is protons have a very special quality in that they travel through matter, so through your body, they treat your tumour, but within a few millimetres, they've deposited all their energy, so there is no exit dose, as compared to conventional therapy, which travels in, treats your tumour, but then there is an exit dose on the other side. So proton beam therapy, you can see, will irradiate less normal tissue. It still ir will irradiate some on the way in, but none on the way out. And why is that such good news for patients and the people who love them? 
there are two bits of good news here. The first bit of good news is for those patients who we already cure with radiation therapy, we may be able to reduce the burden of their late effects because we And what are late effects? What what does that mean, late effects? So for example, I, I'm a paediatric radiation oncologist. I mainly treat children and teenagers. And what I know is that we can cure many of these um, children and teenagers, but because of the treatments they've had, they have a lot of long-term ongoing health issues in and around, for example, growth, if we're treating a brain tumour, ability to achieve at school, um, problems with needing hormone replacements, depending on which glands we end up having to treat, fertility issues. And of course, anytime we irradiate any normal tissue, you have a small risk of many years later developing a second tumour. So all these sort of late effects can be reduced with the use of proton beam therapy. The other advantage of proton beam therapy is that for some hard to treat tumours, we are unable to get dose, the correct dose into that tumour because the tumour is sitting right beside a critical structure, which is limiting our ability to give that dose. With proton beam therapy, we are more able to get that dose in. And so for that very small subgroup of tumours, we have a chance of increasing cure. But that is actually the smaller group of tumours. The main reason we use protons in teenagers and children is to reduce their burden of late effects. So proton therapy has got great potential, but it's also very new. When does your centre open in London? So our centre will open later on this year, and we're very excited about that opening. We're, we're working very hard to get that date realised. So really, uh, the arrival of proton therapy in London, uh, indeed the arrival of proton therapy anywhere, is a giant learning curve for the entire radiation therapy community. And I know you're going to be working closely with the Christie in Manchester, uh, who are already offering proton therapy in the National Health Service. And we've interviewed them for this series. Just tell us the primary group of patients that the Christie and yourselves are going to be working with, who will they be? And how will you cooperate in terms of data collection and research so you can monitor long term uh, the late effects for patients? So the sort of patients we're treating are patients who have tumours in hard to reach places and children and teenagers. And the sort of tumours we are treating are tumours that occur in the brain, around the spinal cord and in the pelvis. And why are they the primary group that both you and the Christie will be treating? So in terms of children and teenagers, the advantage of protons is this reduction in long-term side effects. For some of the adult um, patients, we, we struggle to get the adequate doses into these patients um, with conventional therapy. So I'm thinking really of the base of skull chordomas, chondrosarcomas, pelvic chordomas, chondrosarcomas. We are, we are also looking at groups of patients that might benefit from protons, but the case isn't yet made. And the first randomized clinical control trial in protons has already started at the Christie, which is, which is a trial called Torpedo, looking at the use of protons in head and neck cancer and comparing outcomes with conventional photon therapy. You, you've raised that question of the evidence base. And uh, can you just give us a, a, a nutshell assessment of the state of the evidence? Because we're, th there's still work to be done, isn't there, to be sure of the late effects benefits? Absolutely. So a lot of the evidence for proton therapy in terms of late effects is modelling data in the first instance, but more and more data is now coming out from clinical practice. And we're very aware that within the NHS, we have a huge responsibility to collect this data. So the Christie and UCLH are involved in a common data collection so that we're collecting outcome data on all the patients we treat, both clinical outcome data, but also patient reported outcome data so that in time to come, we will be able to see what the benefits of proton beam therapy actually are, both clinically and from a patient perspective. And when I, you talk about that patient perspective, my understanding, Yen, is that you feel 
passionately that while it is critical to look at the physical issues of long-term side effects and whether they're reduced by proton therapy, we also need to look at the psychological issues. Can you just speak to that? Why do you think that's important to study as well? Well, I think that I have a particular practice in looking after adults who had um, treatment for cancer as children. And certainly there is a burden of psycho, uh, there's a psychological burden for some of these patients in regard to the treatment they had before, which isn't necessarily um, directly related to the actual physical burden of their side effects. And 20 or 30 years ago, I don't think as a profession, as a, as a society, we really looked at well-being and we really looked at psychological health. And I think moving on in time, we are looking at that more proactively now. And so my hope very much is that as we look at that more proactively now during the active phase of treatment, it may mean that in the future, the children and teenagers that grow up and survive their cancer, don't carry that psychological burden any longer. Just before I, I, I leave the patient groups that you'll be working with later this year with proton therapy, you've mentioned this torpedo trial for head and neck cancer patients. I'm a survivor, eight years today, as a matter of fact, my treatment began <laughs> <laughs> with radiation and chemo for oropharyngeal, tonsil, tongue and throat cancer. Um, why has head and neck cancer been chosen for the first clinical trial, just, just in a nutshell? I think that um, head and neck cancer patients, while outcomes can be very good in terms of survival, they do carry a huge burden of late side effects. And many of those are hidden. So you can't see them. So you don't see the fact that head and neck patients struggle to, to eat a normal diet because they have a dry mouth. You don't see that actually their voices may be more fatigued because we've irradiated that area that um, their voice box and the things that help control swallowing. So I think that really this trial is trying to not only make sure that patients survive because that at the end that at the end of the day is the primary aim of treatment but they survive with a better quality of survival it's been an absolutely charming speaking to you thank you so much for all that information i think we'll we'll meet some members of your team thank you absolutely Now, and this is all set up with a lot of our quality assurance devices to ensure that the machine is delivering the beat exactly as we want it to deliver, deliver for the patients. And um, so, here we are in the proline gantry room. This is the tabletop, the couch that the patient will lie on for their treatment. And before treatment, what we'll do is we'll position the patients on the couch using some form of what we call a mobilisation. So this is something that helps to keep the patient still for their treatment in the same position. It's really, really important that the treatment is really accurate. So what I'm going to do is show you how the table goes up under the gantry, but it very gently moves up from under the gantry. align the patient and exactly the, the reference point we want to use from which we want to treat the patient. When we're happy that they're in the right position, what we can do is take some images. We've got imaging panels on our gantry. So at this point on the floor, on either side of the gantry, this point and on the opposite side here, we've got X-ray imaging panels. And this allows us to take either 2D images of our patients as if you were having a plain chest x-ray or to do like a CT scan of the patient as well to ensure that, that the patient's in exactly the right position that we're happy that their internal anatomy as well is as it was when we planned the treatment. Once we're happy with everything, we can go outside the room in order to switch on the beam. And this is going to actually move around the patient when we're treating. Positions. 
to the frontal vein itself comes out of this part of the vein, which is called the nozzle. Well, it's welcome now to uh, another member of the team at uh, University College London Hospital NHS Foundation Trust uh, in the proton therapy team. It's Laura Allington. Welcome, Laura. Can you tell us what your job is, your role, and, and what you're doing to contribute to the opening of this new proton therapy service? Hello, Julie. It's lovely to meet you too. Um, so I'm the oper operational lead for proton beam therapy at UCLH. I'm actually a therapeutic radiographer by profession, so I'm trained to plan and deliver um, radiotherapy and proton beam therapy for patients. Um, but I've been in my current role as operational lead for the service for about four and a half years now, although I've actually been involved in the proton beam therapy project at UCLH for about five, five and a half years in total. So over the past few years, my role has been to help to implement the service. And that has been from designing and building a workforce, being involved in the design of the department um, and to procuring the, the equipment that we are installing and have commission and commissioning currently in our department. Going forward, when we open um, later this year, I will be managing the staff that are working within the department. So we have a wide multidisciplinary team that I will manage um, predominantly a team of radiographers. We make about, been to about 50 radiographers. Um, but also within my team, I have nurses, health place specialists, an admin and clerical team as well. Um, so a wide, um, diverse um, group of professions. Um, so I'm responsible for managing the service, for ensuring that we'll, we'll constantly be progressing and evolving as well. So once we've opened, it doesn't stop there. We're constantly implementing and evolving new things. The theme of this whole series is uh, is how do we improve the radiation experience for patients and families? And obviously, proton therapy is a kind of radiation. Now, I understand that you engaged in quite a deep engagement with all different sorts of potential patients in order to consult them about the sort of service they wanted. So tell us what you did to consult and then some of the practical results based on the recommendations from the people you spoke to. Um, so, as you say, Julie, we've been engaging with our patient groups um, since about 2017. We've run a series of engagement groups um, that have addressed, that have met with the different age groups that we're going to be seeing coming in our de into our department. As Yen has already highlighted, we're going to have a large proportion of teenagers um, and young adults and paediatric patients. Um, but at the same time, we'll also be seeing uh, about two thirds of our service will be seeing adults too. So we've engaged with all the different age groups and looked at different aspects, such as the design and feel of the centre. Accommodation, we'll be providing accommodation for patients when they come for radiotherapy. What activities do they want to do when they're in the centre as distraction and to make it feel warm and welcoming? And we've also looked at the provision of patient information, um, which is really important in familiarising them with the processes prior to them arriving in the centre, but also throughout their treatment to help them to manage their treatment and their side effects. So um, they, the patients really have influenced the design and feel of the centre. We're tucked below ground. We're, on, um, we're actually almost 30 metres below ground in our proton centre. But what we've managed to do is to make it feel light and airy. And so we've, we've got a nature theme running through the centre, which was actually the idea of our patient groups. So they really have influenced the look and feel of the centre that they're going to visit, be visiting. The feel of dappled light through, through trees has been one thing that we've tried to create in some of the areas. So we're very much making patients feel, hopefully, that although we're deep tucked in the ground inside, that, that they are actually connected with what's happening in the outside around them. So when it comes to accommodation, the, the groups that we consulted on were patients who had actually stayed away from home for six to eight weeks of proton beam therapy, um, predominantly at Jacksonville in Florida. And one thing that, they, that came out crystal clear to us was that we really needed to create a home from home environment. Patients didn't want to stay in hotels. They wanted to have their own living rooms. They wanted to have their own kitchen so they could cater for their families. And they wanted it to feel homely. Um, and that's what we've tried to create when we've gone out to procure the, the accommodation. A really important thing as well that we found out from our patient groups is they wanted to have a communal space they found, found that when they were away from home, they got a lot of peer support informally from other families that were going through a similar experience to them. So as part of our accommodation tender, we've asked that we can provide that communal space for our families to drop in and meet, meet each other and get to know each other and to get that support from each other. 
Tell us about their requests for information and how you're meeting them, please. Providing information starts very early for us in our patient pathway. Um, And so we're trying to ensure that there are lots of different ways that we can provide information because, again, our patient groups told us that they wanted to receive sometimes paper-based information or information via an intranet. Um, So there's lots of different ways that we're we're creating that provision. Um, They asked for real-life photographs in our in our information um, booklets or on our websites, they could really understand the service that they were going to be visiting. And another thing that we've, they also um, asked for was a patient app for our younger patient groups. And this is an interactive app that patients will be able to download onto a tablet or a phone. Um, And they'll be able to create their own avatar and to actually to visit the department virtually and to learn about the different type, the different treatment that they're going to be receiving and about the staff that they're going to meet. So really important as part of the play therapy and build up to a course of protein therapy for our younger cohort. You mentioned um, the important, the request by patients uh, for a, a sort of a common room, a place they could come together. And I was just thinking when you spoke about professional collaboration, that sort of allows for patient and family collaboration, doesn't it? And I think Macmillan has got involved. Can you explain who Macmillan are and how they've contributed in London uh, to a place for patients? Yep, so Macmillan is a a UK cancer charity that provides advice and support among many things to to the cancer patients in the UK. And we're very fortunate to have gained some funding from them to create an additional space in our centre. It's it's called the Macmillan Living Room. And this isn't a waiting room. It really is a place where patients can just drop in and grab a cup of tea or coffee if they want to. There's quite a quiet space so they can just sit and reflect and be on their own if they want to. Um, but there are also spaces to for them to meet other patients and to get that peer support, which we've heard from our patient engagement groups, is so important when they're undergoing proton beam therapy. It's also an information, an area where they can gather information too. And they can use this space at any time during the day. And we will also, once we're open, run, run some groups from there. So we're looking at running some mindfulness sessions and some art activities, the distractions and activities that the patients discuss with us that they wanted to see coming into our centre. Laura, an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Julie. Well, our final team member uh, from University College London Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust is Jessica Cantwell. And you are an Australian. Introduce yourself uh, in terms of your job and your role in the Proton Therapy Centre about to open in London, but also explain your connection, I think, to Westmead, uh, west of Sydney. Hi, Julie. Yeah, you're right. So I am an Australian in London. Um, I So my role at UCLH is I'm the paediatric and teenage and young adult specialist therapeutic radiographer. So um, in Australia, that's a, a it, the job title is a radiation therapist. So my role here in um, London is the, I am the lead radiographer for the paediatric um, and TYA cohort that come through for protons as well as the radiotherapy service. Um and then, so my connection back to Australia and back to Westmead is like, that's the centre that I had trained in. So I'm, an, I'm a, a radiation therapist trained in Australia and I worked at Westmead as a paediatric specialist radiographer there for a few years as well before I moved over here to London to pursue the interest in the, the sort of professional development as a radiographer working in protons. When children and young people do come through for radiotherapy, of course, it's quite a daunting experience. It's something that they're not particularly familiar with. So... Um, we do really offer a really tailored service to the paediatric and young people to ensure that they come through and they're very well. We have a team of play specialists that work in the department alongside myself um, who, you know, as a team, we all sort of work to make sure that the patient's build a relationship with us first. We don't kind of rush into the the technical mumbo jumbo that we're talking about. Um, So we we like to build that relationship first and then sort of really as the patient is able to sort of step into that information giving and a bit of a familiarisation with the service that we have sort of quite quite an extensive range of preparatory material as far as, you know, video preparations and opportunities to see the machinery or see even some of the, the 
equipment. So we use immobilization equipment on, on all of our patients, children and adults, and that is just a, a way to ensure that each day when the treatment is delivered that the patient's in the, in the same spot every day. Um, so here, you know, we can help the kids sort of experience making those immobilization equipments for their teddies or for their toys or for some the, some toys that exist in the department as well. So it's a really inclusive thing as well for the patients to become involved in um, and hands on so that they kind of can feel comfortable before then those procedures are performed on themselves. And can I ask you, Jessica, as a radiographer or what Australians call a radiation therapist, do you work with the play therapist to build this relationship and engage in some of these activities, to show them the room, we call it the bunker, where the big machine is and so on. Do you actually get involved at, in that level? Yes, certainly, certainly. So the children um, often are accompanied by it's myself as a radiographer or any of the radiographic team within the department. So, and that would be alongside our play specialist team as well to go into the things like the CT scanner or into the bunker, just to give the children an opportunity to see how the machine moves, what the room looks like. I think um, quite often it, I, from a, from a patient perspective, the, the bunkers and the treatment machine that we're using, there is a lot of images available on websites and things like that. But until you really go in there, it's a really nice experience for the kids to actually see what the machine looks like. So certainly either myself or other radiographers are in with the children and the play specialist team, allowing the children to sort of see how the machines work. And we can pop teddy bears and their toys and their dolls and things in the position that they would be laying in and, you know, move the scan and the couch top the way that it would move so that they they feel a little bit less frightened. I think children, if they are given an opportunity to actually see what's happening, it's hard to kind of imagine what they're being told by people until they can actually see it and imagine it for themselves. Just before I ask you uh, my final question, play therapists play a very significant role in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. Could you just tell us about that role and do you think they could be play, uh, more commonly available in Australia? Just a little bit of cross-national comparison. Yes, certainly. So um, the radiotherapy play specialist role, so they're, they're qualified health play specialists and we have a team employed in our proton and radiotherapy department and their role is to... Um, really offer that support for the patients to ensure that there's no anxieties around treatment. They're also incredibly key personnel in our, for our children and young people to actually educate them on radiotherapy. So our play specialists actually have a huge radiotherapy knowledge about the procedures and they their, their training is actually to see it from a, a children's point of view and to be able to kind of advocate for the patients um, that they might be able to see something that we as radiographers, to us, it's a very it's a very day-to-day -day thing that we're doing every day. Um, for the play specialist, I think part of their role is really important to actually kind of look at a situation or look at something or really get to know a child and their anxieties and actually say, do you know what, this, this particular child might actually find this procedure a little bit, a little bit scary can we just maybe take a little bit of extra time? So they are a really key patient advocate to ensure that our, pay, our children and young people do actually have a really nice, comfortable um, experience. So I would say without doubt, I think there is a huge, huge opportunity for um, play specialist involvement in radiotherapy departments, not just in the UK and Australia, but kind of everywhere. Do you use any small models of either the CT scanner or the radiation therapy machine, the LINAC or the proton therapy machine to help educate kids? Yes, certainly. So we have a few different varieties of um, sort of miniature equipment that the children can use. So that could be something, you know, as simple as a Lego set that can actually be built to be made into a CT scanner or an MRI or actually even a treatment gantry. We also have a Within the radiotherapy, so the conventional radiotherapy department has a mini LINAC. So when I say LINAC, the linear accelerator is actually the treatment delivery machine. So that is a, around the size that a, a, something a Barbie doll size could go on there in where the patient actually would lie and the children have got the operation to use, the opportunity to use the controller to move the gantry around in the position that they're going to experience. Within the proton centre, we also have... Um, 
a, a similar sort of piece of equipment, but that will be in the pro beam, which is the actual proton delivery unit, as well as the MRI scanner that we're using in the radiotherapy department. So they're really great opportunities for those children to kind of get desensitized to what's what, what, what they're going to experience. And the last question, which I realised I had never asked anybody as I walked into my bunker the first time is, do you feel the radiation or the proton therapy? Do you feel anything while it's happening? No, that is a question that we get quite a lot. And no, you definitely don't feel anything at all. So if you imagine that the protons and conventional radiotherapy alike are almost just like an X-ray in that, or a scan per se, in that you might hear the machine turn on or you might hear a bit of a buzzing noise, but you won't feel anything at all. Lovely to talk to you. And uh, I hope we see you back in Australia sometime. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Well, wonderful to see that work being done in the United Kingdom. Joining me now from Adelaide is Shona Edwards, who we met briefly earlier, who was treated with proton therapy in Prague a couple of years ago. Shona, we're going to hear more about your experience shortly, but just what you've just seen there in Britain and what they're preparing to do. Two or three things that you think are positive for patients, I guess particularly for young adult patients. From a patient point of view, the things that stick out to me were the ways that they're making it less intimidating and less scary. Um, and we were talking in that interview about uh, children, but Julie, I'm sure you agree. It's scary for everybody to be in these machines. So I love hearing that the children can actually manipulate the model and the toy models. It's just so important to have that sense of control um, and something uniquely emotional about um, directly interacting. Uh, and so they have those models, but also the app with the avatar. I love that idea. Um, the communal space of the accommodation. Again, though, this is, you might be coming from another country. It's so important to have a shared experience to connect with people. Um, and then you get peer support. So I love the sound of that. That sounds fantastic. Well, Shona, let's hear now more about what happened to you when you went to Prague and hear about your particular radiation experience. Just quickly, can you tell us what, what cancer did you have and, and why did you go for proton therapy and go all the way to Czechoslovakia? So I've got a grade three papillary meningioma at the base of my spine. So it sits over my sacrum um, and that's a tumour that comes from the lining of the nerve and nerves in the spinal cord. So the position of that tumor um, meant that if I had regular radiation, um, the radiation would penetrate also my uterus, ovaries, and the organs around. So essentially proton therapy allowed uh, me to get radiation without putting the other organs at risk around it. So in that sense, proton therapy was just to stop the growth of the tumour, which it has done, but I still have the tumour at the base of my spine there. Uh, so, it's, so the sacrum is at the base of your spine? It's that heart-shaped one at the very bottom, yeah. You uh, are using a wheelchair as I speak to you now. Are you able to walk? Yeah, so when I first had proton treatment, it flared up um, my pain and I had quite significant decline in my mobility. Um, so I was using two crutches to hobble. But uh, since then I've been doing physiotherapy, rehab. Um, so now I have to sit in a wheelchair for pain reasons and fatigue reasons more than anything. But I walk with um, a single walking stick now. So I've definitely improved in the last couple of years. I'm very, very pleased to hear that, needless to say. <laughs> now I know you're a passionate advocate as I am. And this whole series is about how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. And of course, proton therapy is a kind of radiation that's soon coming to Australia. One of the things you're keen about is having agency and control during treatment. What do those words mean, agency and control? When we think about the cancer experience, you have to think about um, how that can make you feel like your whole life is out of control, basically. you know. Treatment can affect your hair, it can affect your weight, perhaps you have to stop studying or working. Um, and so you're at risk of losing the things that define your identity. So if we can give patients um, choices, that lets them express themselves um, and they can feel a little bit of control in very small ways um, and that has a really big impact in the long term. Can you give us some 
some examples of the sort of things people can do at the new Proton Therapy Centre in Australia when it opens or anywhere dealing with radiation that can give particularly younger patients a sense of agency and control? So as you say, teenagers and young adults are especially vulnerable to that feeling that they're losing control um, because they're just starting to learn who they are and then that's at risk of being taken away from them, even if it's just temporarily. So something like having a diary, being given a diary, printouts of your month or your year calendar of appointments can make you feel um, that you know what's coming and what's expected of you. And that seems like such a small thing, but it can change how you plan your week and your month and just how you feel about that. Are there um, digital versions of diaries like that? Because uh, as having been a patient myself, it can change so rapidly from week to week or even day to day, can't it? Who you need to see or what test or more blood tests or whatever. Yeah, that's true. I actually found, um, I'm sure you understand that in cancer treatment, often you have brain fog. Things like focusing on small devices and small texts can be quite hard for some patients. So I found hard copy versions preferable myself. I found things like putting up on a whiteboard even, just a layout of the week, and then doctors and nurses can uh, adjust what your appointments are quite easily that way, but a digitally would work as well. Just something that you can check and see, um, especially if it's, you know, visual representation can be really helpful. And where did you have the whiteboard? Um, that was in, uh, when I had treatment in the Royal Adelaide Hospital just down the road, um, I had that in my room there with a whiteboard of appointments. So I found that very helpful. Another issue I think you have strong feelings about is the importance of engaging with young patients about clinical decision making. Tell us more about that. I think it's quite easy to get, um, with, especially with young patients, for the uh, providers to accidentally start addressing the parents and you sort of end up talking over the patient's head a little. But providers really need to remember that, especially with young adults, the patient is the one that you're addressing first and foremost. Um, so, yeah, I think young people, you want to be letting them know and having that eye contact and that personal contact to say that they are the ones in control and they're the ones being addressed here. How old were you when you were having your treatment? I was 23, so this is a couple of years ago, yeah. I mean, you'd expect at that age that you would get eye contact, but you clearly feel that's something that we need to remind our clinical teams about. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, especially when you have, we've got, most people have blended families nowadays. You can end up with quite a few people in the room to help support you there. And it can be kind of like you're addressing a crowd as a practitioner, I feel. Um, and you do want to make sure that everybody feels involved. That's important for the support people as well. Um, as I think with young adults, it's easy to fall back on the things that are comfortable and you trust your parents and you trust that they'll represent your needs. So it, you kind of fall back into um, childhood patterns, I think, as a young adult cancer patient. Let's turn to uh, being prepared for the actual proton therapy, uh, the actual treatment. When you were treated in Prague in the Czech Republic, they had tours of the treatment centre, including the bunkers. Can you explain what the bunker are and the treatment centres and why you think those tours are an idea worthy of being taken up in Australia? Sure. So um, in Prague, my parents went on a tour after the working day. Um, the facility I was treated at was an outpatient centre, so they didn't treat people in the evenings. Um, and it was an opportunity for them to ask questions of someone who isn't a busy working doctor and actually see it because uh, I was going to the bunker each day by myself. My parents never went in, so they didn't actually know what it looked like until they went on these tours. Um, the bunkers in the Prague Centre were sort of a few doors in. They were separate from the main reception areas. So it's quite a um, uh, cavernous experience to go down into the depths of a building and then spend this time in a bunker getting treated. Um, it feels quite closed off. And why do you think it's important that parents and family get to see the bunker? Uh, how does it help you as a patient? Well, I think it's important for the parents and support people to have a chance to ask questions, to actually understand the treatment that you're getting. Um, and this is really important because uh, it allows them to feel like they're involved. Um, 
and it cancer treatment is such an alienating experience as a patient that you really want people around you who understand. Um, and I find in any situation, it's the unknown and the uncertainty that's the scariest thing. So if we can just expose people to the information, then that demystifies the whole process for everybody. You'd like to see those tools made available to the general public and certainly to members of multidisciplinary cancer teams within the Australian Proton Therapy Centre. Why do you say that? I think um, we've got a real opportunity here in Adelaide to be a hub for medical research. So I think outreach, not just to the public, but say to medical students to encourage them to pursue this field um, would be a fantastic opportunity. And like you say, multidisciplinary providers can see the process and what actually happens and better understand how they can provide for their patients in their own areas if they understand the whole experience better. Let's deal with that multidisciplinary issue now, if I may, because uh, it's well known that the best treatment is provided, whether it's conventional radiation therapy or proton therapy, in a multidisciplinary team environment with the highest possible volume of patients. So everybody gets the experience and expertise. Can you explain why you think that team and having good numbers of staff team members, including allied health nurses, as well as the radiation therapists and the uh, various kinds of doctors, is absolutely critical to the patient experience. Why is it important to have the team and the allied health? Well, I think it's important to remember that the cancer experience goes beyond your first diagnosis and it goes beyond your treatment, especially in my case, um, cancer diagnosis has come along with chronic health conditions and disability. So I think if you start from the beginning with a multidisciplinary team, then that can get you engaged in services that you're going to continue to access beyond treatment. Um, and you have to remember the cancer experience is more than just surgery and radiation. It's psychological treatment, it's pain management, um, and it's the rehab afterwards. You particularly benefited from physiotherapy and a rather remarkable piece of technology. And we've got some film of that we can show while you're explaining it. So why did you need physiotherapy and what were you offered at the Women and Children's Hospital in Adelaide that was just so beneficial? Physiotherapy for me uh, was the difference in quality of life for me. So I was lucky enough through the Youth Cancer Service to have access to an exercise physiologist before I went to treatment. So we did a kind of pre-treatment rehab or prehab to get me as strong as possible before I went, um, which was for the best because while I was in treatment, I was bedridden. I had really severe pain um, and severe mobility issues. So. I really needed to get as strong as possible. And that had benefits for my fatigue, for my psychological well-being, And it gave me that sense of control that I thought I was being proactive about my treatment. So one of the things I had access to was the Locomat. So the Locomat is a piece of uh, robotic medical equipment that can teach you essentially how to walk correctly. So it takes pressure off your legs, it can lift you. So that way you can develop uh, strength again gradually. And the robotic legs sort of force your legs through a correct pace and a correct gait. So that allowed me to stretch my nerves and my muscle after treatment. Um, and I went from, as I said, hobbling on two sticks to able to walk confidently again. Um, and that made a huge difference. Um, and that was not available to the public. That was only through a study, as you say, at the Women's and Children's Hospital. So it'd be fantastic if people could have more access to uh, things like that. Tell us about your other concerns about things like transport from accommodation to treatment, and then the capacity of someone using a wheelchair or with mobility issues to actually get to all the different places you need to get during and after treatment. Disability accessibility is more than just being able to enter a building. It's um, how easy that entrance is and how that makes you feel. So accessibility is so much more than just the actual infrastructure. Um, but for me, as I said, I had quite severe pain and mobility issues during my treatment. So the way that I was transported from my hotel room to, my, uh, to the treatment at the outpatient center was by lying face down on a hospital gurney in a, an ambulance. 
So there's no um, non-emergency service available to the public in South Australia for um, tra transport of patients like that who are very vulnerable. Um, and so my concern is that we want to have patients not left waiting any longer than they have to and to minimise how much distress and pain they're in to have that process of transport be as efficient as possible. Um, that was a ma major factor in my own treatment. Look, let's come to um, some other particular needs of young people, uh, teenagers, school children, young adults. A and you, you raise issues around having the capacity to manage your school or university or TAFE or other studies or work during prolonged treatment, but also the need for privacy and for separation of age groups. Tell us about these particular needs and what you want to see. Yeah, so when I was diagnosed, it was actually the first week of my, what I thought was the last year of my undergraduate degree. So I was trying to get in as much study as I could while attending a lot of appointments and spending a lot of time waiting in crowded, quite noisy waiting rooms. So I can't underemphasize how important it is for young people to have access to a quiet study space. Um, and one thing that uh, has done, been done very well is the Sony UCAN Foundation has provided spaces in hospitals across Australia for youths and young adult patients to um, have a space that's not their hospital room to go to. So this is a quiet study space where they have computers, internet access, but they also have kitchen facilities and more social spaces with couches, TVs, um, PlayStations, where they can meet their friends and feel like they have that continuity with their outside life. Um, so those spaces are invaluable, especially to young adult patients. There needs to be rooms where people can retreat and be alone and also separate from other waiting patients. Why are they important? Right, so I think a welcoming and open uh, waiting room space is really important, but you do need the alternative um, for patients such as in my situation where I was on a hospital bed, uh, face down, very vulnerable and feeling very self-conscious. So in Prague, I had access to a small quiet room where I could wait with my parents before my treatment in the bunker. Um, and that allowed us to have the lights dimmed, the noise very quiet, so that I was less distressed. And I think the same could be provided for underage children who ideally um, the parents and their doctors are, would be, have a private space to deal with things that can be really distressing with younger patients in proton therapy. So for some patients, they have to be sedated in order to lie still. Um, and they really need somewhere that they feel safe and secure to recover from that sedation each time. Um, the other thing that would be useful would be perhaps uh, organizing appointments around similar age groups. So that alienation that a teenager might feel, that awkwardness sitting next to a four-year-old patient is sort of avoided. In Prague, they had a patient coordination team, uh, which I gather had a lot of former cancer patients in it. What did you see in Prague that was good and what do you want to see in Australia? Right, so I was traveling overseas and if we have patients traveling here, which I assume we will as the first uh, proton therapy centre in the Southern Hemisphere, um, that you're dealing with a lot of things that need coordination. There's accommodation, there's things like transport, as we spoke about, and um, even internet, phone plans, food, all of those things need coordination. So the team in Prague were amazing with helping us. They checked in on us daily and made sure that we were ready for my treatment each day, and that allowed their um, therapy to happen on time with minimal delays. Um, I think if we can provide that coordination, everything just runs a little smoother. Can I ask you, uh, and we're going to ask everybody we interview for this series, what is proton therapy? If you were explaining it to another woman in her, or another young person in their early 20s, and they said, what is proton therapy? What, what would you say? I'm not excellent on the science of it. I'll admit I'm a humanities student. Um, as far as explaining it to some, another patient, I would say you, it's less invasive than surgery. It's quite serious. You go into a machine, um, you have a high dose of radiation, which I refer to as my intense sunburn on my back. Um, and then that way, 
the rep proton can penetrate and it stops at the point that we need it to. It doesn't go all the way through. So that's the difference between that and regular radiation. But it's just, I liken it to uh, a sort of a journey to the underworld that you go into the depths of this bunker, you have a strange magical experience and you come out the other side. So that's my explanation of it. That is fantastic. Uh, I too was a humanities a student and I did Latin and ancient history and it truly is a journey to the underworld uh, and we emerge and that's the great part. It's, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you Shona. Thank you so much. No worries. Lovely to talk to you. And here we are again and Shona's with us live from Adelaide. Shona, just before we meet our, our next uh, interesting person talking about the curative capacity of radiation. You also had an experience with an app in Prague, but I think you've more recently discovered a very interesting bit of work being done with an app at Peter McCullum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. Just give us a quick message about that. The Peter McCullum Cancer Centre um, has been developing um, an app that's currently in the test stages at the moment, and it's designed specifically for um, adolescents and young adult patients. Um, and it provides um, information on a range of topics. So it has links to different um, blurbs and it has videos with other providers, but with other patients as well. And it has a space to set goals um, and to note down the symptoms. So I think it's a fantastic opportunity to have a bunch of options all in one space on an app. Look, thanks, Jonah, and thank you again from all of us uh, for sharing, you know, in such a very thoughtful way, the lessons from your experience so far as a, as a patient. And uh, I also want to say to people who've been sending us questions and comments in the Q&A and chat, I've taken down all the uh, questions and comments that you've made and we'll get some feedback for you uh, and I'll e we'll be emailing both the questions and the comments uh, to everyone who's registered uh, for this first webinar in our series of four tonight. Look, I just want to give you a preview before we end tonight's webinar of a, 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 an interview to come next week where we again will be looking at proton therapy and we'll be travelling again to the United Kingdom uh, to meet people from the Rutherford uh, Cancer Centres, uh, members of multidisciplinary teams there. But here's a moment with uh, Dr Unji Wang, a radiation oncologist who spent time at the Christie in the United Kingdom. The overall theme of these uh, webinars is, you know, what can we do to improve the p radiation experience, including proton therapy, the radiation experience for patients and families. And we have done a whole feature on the Christie. Uh, but as someone who spent, I think, a year there uh, working, three or four of the things they're doing there that you think really add benefit uh, to patients, particularly the, the children, adolescents and yeah. young adults. Yeah, no... They're doing lots of great things there, um, which I'm sure you saw as well as you've interviewed people there. I think the really the key thing that they're doing well is really their holistic approach to their care and management of patients, particularly children. And this goes from looking at details such as providing accommodation for people who live far away and this is weeks of treatment sometimes you know five six seven weeks of treatment providing accommodation um, that's funded for them accommodation oh sorry so accommodation as also as transport daily to receive their treatment there's also a school provided within the center so that education um, is being continued for the children in as you know as as sort of similar a way as back home. Um, equally, they really designed the space thoughtfully to be appropriate for paediatrics. There's also a separate corner for teenage young adults. Um, and I think of another crucial thing that they've um, incorporated within their staffing is someone called a key worker. And this is not necessarily someone who's uh, nursing trained or radiation therapy trained, and can be either or, but it's someone who really walks through a treatment journey uh, consistently with the parent and their family or an adult, um, and it becomes a familiar face and a real point of contact for patients who are trying to navigate all these different cogs um, within their treatment journey. Oh, that's fantastic. And that was Dr. Unji Huang, who has uh, spent a year at the Christie. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. I'd be most grateful if you could uh, share your impressions 
and to help us to promote the next three in this series of four webinars. Our second webinar, as I said, will again look at proton therapy. It's in one week's time, Thursday the 20th of May at 7.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. And uh, in part two of, of proton therapy, we'll have the full interview with Dr. Unji Huang, uh, which goes into considerable uh, depths about both the science as well as the uh, patient and family experience. And we will meet uh, both a, a, a doctor, two radiographers, as they're called, or radiation therapists, and also uh, one of the co-founders of the Rutherford Cancer Centres who've got a, a network of proton therapy centres in the United Kingdom. It has. We have had a, a number of questions and comments, as I said, and we will, uh, in a totally de-identified way, have the questions and comments that were made to us tonight and the answers, and we'll email them out uh, to everyone who's registered uh, for tonight's webinar. And all the interviews from this series, both tonight and in the subsequent three webinars, are going to go on to our YouTube channel, and we'll be promoting them as individual uh, um, interviews extensively uh, in the weeks and months to come. For those of you who joined us a bit late, the fundamental purpose is to share the views of patients and family members and multidisciplinary cancer team members about how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. And we're looking at both proton therapy, this new type of radiation that's coming uh, to Australia in a couple of years' time, the uh, Australian, the Bragg Centre for, the Australian Bragg Centre for Proton Therapy and Research currently being built in Adelaide. Uh, but we'll also uh, be looking at conventional radiation therapy with a particular focus on children, young people and adults. We'll be going uh, to Westmead and to other centres uh, across Australia and a whole one and a half hour uh, webinar will be on closing the gap in cancer survival and quality of life for First Nations people uh, with a, a tremendous overview of really good work that's happening across Australia. So we're finished for tonight and I just want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you to Shona Edwards and uh, who'll be joining us again as a co-host uh, next week and uh, we look forward to you joining us again in a week's time. Thank you very much. Thank you.